Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing and know that the Lord, he is God. Stand with us this morning as he, this band ushers us into the throne room of God this morning. Thank you, guys. Glad you're here.
Christ is my firm foundation. He's the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So I I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I've built my life on Jesus. And he's never
Hallelujah. What a great song. Please be seated. I think Dwayne wanted to spice it up a little bit this morning and get some help, so he brought his better half. And we're so grateful that Mrs. <coughs> Cresswell has joined Mr. Cresswell. So thank you for that. Absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful voice. Thank y'all. That's right. Good job. Thank you for coming. So uh, as you notice, John Howard and Claudia are not here. They're with our college house ministry on a college retreat leading worship. So that's why these three or four rows are empty over here and the rest of them is because it's Labor Day weekend. But we're glad each and every one of you guys are here uh, to worship with us this morning and to hear the word preached. First of all, I want to say if you're visiting with us this morning, grab one of these. Whether it's your first time here, your 17th visit, if you've been visiting regularly, we'd love to have a record of your visit. This is a connection card. There are about every three or four seats in front of you. Fill one of those out, drop it in the offering plate that we'll be passing here momentarily. And uh, we'd love to have that record of your visit. Just a couple of announcements real quick. Patriots Day breakfast is September the 11th. Attention all military families in the church and St. Luke's school. If you have children that go to the school or y'all come here to the church, we'd love to invite you to register. There's a QR code in the bulletin right now. I'm sure you could probably see Tony Maine. He'd love to ask, answer questions that you might have as well. So September the 11th, this starts at 7.15 in the morning. 7.15 a.m. breakfast on September the 11th. Register now. And uh, this is a great ministry that Tony has started to be able to support military children and their families and to make sure they're aware of everything that Columbus has to offer as well as St. Luke. So thank you, Tony, uh, for your leadership there as well. Just a couple of other things. St. Luke summer camp's coming. Get registered for summer camp. Let's go have a blast. Also, mission trips. Uh, if you need any information on these mission trips, please see me. Uh, if it's about the June or uh, July trip to Kenya, you can see myself. Uh, Nicole Main, Suzanne McCluskey, I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Uh, the Mexico trip is also on there. Please see me about that. If you just want to register, go ahead and scan that QR code, get that application in, reserve your spot. Now's the time to be praying about that for you and your family to experience a life-changing mission trip together. So with that being said, I want to go ahead and uh, call the ushers up front. If y'all would come down, we'll take up tithes and offerings at this time. And let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you that we can come and make a joyful noise before you. Lord, we pray that you awaken our souls this morning to worship you. Lord, we thank you for the, the very breath in our lungs. We thank you for your presence in this place as we gather to honor you, King Jesus. Father, we thank you for the changing of the seasons, and we thank you for all the many ways that you've blessed our church. Father, at this time, we, we want to honor you as we align our life up with you through our gifts, our tithes, our offerings. Lord, we pray that you bless this time, that it goes out to be the church. Lord, we ask that you bless these funds, these resources, that we might continue ministry right here in Columbus, Georgia and touching different nations all around the world through our missional efforts. Father, we thank you for our pastors and our staff. We thank you for Reverend Wood as he comes this morning to deliver this message. We pray, God, that you speak through him, that we might leave here again just a little bit deeper in love with Jesus. As we draw near to you today, Father, we ask a special touch for those of us that need to see you, need to know that you still see us and love us. Forgive us where we go wrong, God. Forgive us when we don't get it right. But thank you that you are a gracious God. And that you love when your people come back to you. So thank you for that grace. Thank you for your mercy and your goodness in our lives. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we pass the plates by your row, you can then stand and worship with us.
So Lord, we stand here to say with our words, with our songs, that you are King, you are Lord, there is none greater than you. Lord, let our lives be consumed with your greatness and your majesty. Let our eyes be open today to see you in some way that we have never seen you before. That we can stand in awe of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The one through whom are all things. For whom are all things. And by whom are all things and the one by whom all things hold together. We love you. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you this morning. I'm going to give you a, about a minute head start. I'm going to let you grab your Bibles and turn to the book of James. Book of James chapter 1. That's where our passage will be this morning. And a couple weeks ago, I, I stood here and I spoke about the topic of wisdom. And I, I gave you fair warning before I started the message that it could very well Step on your toes, hurt your feelings, and get a little bit in your business as it did for me when I first came across it. And to some extent, the same is true this morning uh, because we are reading from the book of James. And James is a very uh, practical, to the point, matter of fact kind of writer. So when you read James, he just kind of has a way of naturally stepping on our toes, but in a good way. So we're going to read James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. And it's about hearing and doing the word. Okay, hearing and doing the word. James chapter 1, verse 19 through 27, and it reads like this. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Be it, but be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So James talks about hearing and doing. He's talking about words and actions. And if you want to throw in a nice 10 cent seminary word, he's talking about orthodoxy and orthopraxy. In other words, right belief and right practice or action. James is very well aware, as we know, uh, one of the more popular verses in James, he's very well aware of the power of the tongue, the power of words. Um, James speaks openly about what words can do, both to the good and to the ill. And we are to use our words wisely and carefully. And the opening passage of what we read today testifies to that. It says, be quick to listen or quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And we use words in a variety of ways. And I have, I have a good comprehensive but not exhaustive list of the way words are used. So we use words to express ourselves, to convict or convince ourselves, to describe, to name, 
to blame or label things, to win arguments to sell an idea, to lecture to expand upon a point, to explain things, persuade, console, counsel, announce, denounce, deceive, to ask someone to marry, to declare war or peace, to pronounce judgment, diagnose a condition, analyze a problem, negotiate a deal. And those are just a few of the ways in which words can be used. They can harm, they can alarm, they can uplift, they can inspire. Words are even capable of silencing someone else. But James makes clear here and in other places throughout his book that he's has a very real concern about how words are used, how we speak, particularly as followers of Jesus. Because speech is easy, immediate, and yet very hard to control. James actually kind of sees what we say as a test case for faithfulness. James says, you, me, us, we cannot just casually insult our neighbor who, like us, is made in the image of God and then somehow presume that we are approved by God in the process. We cannot invoke God's wrath or judgment on someone else just because we get upset with them. James makes clear that which we know to be true, that we cannot bring about God's righteousness through judgmental or revengeful speech, destructive speech. Because destructive words spoken in anger, they not only poison our lives, they poison our relationships in other people's lives, our family, our work lives, the community that we are a part of, whether it be our faith community or another one. Destructive words or acts, James says, are never the means by which God's righteousness, God's presence, God's love, God's grace can be revealed. And at the same time, James does not sidestep the issue of anger. He acknowledges it. He recognizes its presence and he recognizes its strength. And that's why James gives us a formula for helping to deal with our anger. He doesn't tell us to swallow it to pretend it doesn't exist. Rather, he challenges us to practice dealing with it. And so he says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. And if you can do those two things and exercise wisdom and self-control in those two things, that will help you be slow to anger. And this requires work. This requires effort On our part, right? It especially requires work and effort if we're one of those people who get impatient, who are quick to judge, who walk into a room and assess it very quickly. And and a lot of times we do that, and we may be right, but a lot of times, or perhaps more often than we like to admit, we get it wrong too. Perhaps we're in the middle of a disagreement where Our mind has already been made up. And yet, James says, you need to practice something a little different. And this something requires discipline. It, It requires cultivating the virtues of a discerning spirit. James is calling us to a standard that is higher than the one we have. Because what we say matters and what we do matters. And through faithful activity we become trustworthy followers of Christ. Actions add value to our words. They give them life. They allow the kingdom of God to have relevance and meaning and integrity in the world. And I really thought about that. Our our faithful consistency in our words and actions helps to determine the integrity of the kingdom of God in the world. And James calls us to accountability by acknowledging our need to take responsibility for our anger, that we may be wise in our exercise of self-control. This allows us to become builders of relationships, builders of community, rather than just merely preservers of our own way or desires. 
we are to take seriously our emotional lives, our behavior as key elements, key components of faith. James is driving us toward an all-important understanding that our spiritual integrity, our wholehearted, consistent, comprehensive devotion to God requires of us a particular kind of life and a particular kind of character. As God the Father brought us into being in a loving, life-giving way, so we too are to display God's goodness and generosity and grace by likewise being loving and life-giving in word and in deed toward other people. James understands also our tendency, our human tendency, to add self-concern to our loyalty to God. That often we try to mesh the two. And unfortunately, when that happens, when our loyalties are divided amongst ourselves and amongst God, when things go south, as they eventually will, in times of difficulty, those two things don't really coexist very well. And so James says, listen, just listening, just reading divine teaching without putting it into practice reveals something. It reveals a lack of spiritual maturity on our part. When we listen and we hear and we understand, but we don't do, we end up functioning like a half-hearted semi-believer who still believes that we know best. To look, into our own, to look to our own selves for understanding, James says, is like someone looking in a mirror, gazing admiringly at themselves, and then when they leave, they have to go back quickly to be reminded of who they are supposed to be or what they are supposed to be. James says, on the other hand, if you and I look to God's word, God's commands, God's principles for understanding, then what we will discover is a standard, a consistent, enduring standard of who and what we are supposed to be. James wants us to examine ourselves to challenge ourselves so that we move past the deception of a passive faith. Now, we are blessed here at St. Luke in a lot of ways, and we are blessed with numerous opportunities for people of all ages and stages in life to connect and to grow in their understanding of God, to grow in their faith. But I want to make something clear that James, I think, is making clear here, that there's a difference between knowing about God and knowing God. We have lots of opportunities here at St. Luke for people to learn more and to understand more and to know more about God. We have Sunday school classes and we have Bible studies and we have breakout groups and we have men's and women's small groups. We have numerous connection points that will help people learn more about God, Scripture, and faith. And all of that is good. And all of that is important. Right belief is important. Right understanding is important. But if it is never put into practice for the sake of the kingdom of God, then what good is it doing us? That's what James is wondering and asking. Because to truly know God is, requires more than just participation. To truly know God requires obedience. It requires taking the words off the page and the words out of our minds and putting them into action to put hands and to put feet on them. It is the knowledge that comes from practice and repetition. See, it's through obedience that our hearts are molded and transformed. It is through obedience that we become attuned to seek and carry out the will of God. For the last several months, there's been a group of staff and lay people who have been meeting once a month with a church consultant. And we have had hours and hours of conversations to honestly evaluate who and where we are as a church right now, and also to discern who and where God is calling us to be as we move forward as a church. 
And one of the things we've come to realize and recognize is we cannot be all things to all people. But what we want is to be the best version of who God has called us to be. And I think one thing that every person who has been in that room can tell you, it is, it's not as easy as you might think. There is so much to consider, so much to evaluate. And I think one of the humbling things, and I say this not just as it applies to St. Luke, but to church as a whole, one of the humbling things that we find as we start breaking things down and evaluating them is just how many things happen in the church not necess- that may or may not fulfill the purpose of the church, but it happens because of the preference of the members of the church. And it's one of the reasons why I think this process is so important, especially the fact that it's being led by a trained outside pair of eyes that can see things that we who have been here perhaps don't see it as easily. And I'm not saying anything brilliant or new here, but we're not called to be a preference-driven church. No church is. But when churches stop being obedient, when we stop putting into practice the commands of Scripture, when we may mistake activity for obedience, when we separate our lives into sacred and secular and forget that every aspect of our lives is supposed to be sacred. When we stop allowing our hearts to be transformed because we have somehow in our minds justified not doing what Scripture has asked of us. When the vows of membership that we took to strengthen our church with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness have become suggestions that we may or may not consider then we are at risk of becoming a church that Paul would not readily or easily identify. We risk becoming a church that James would say, we're only getting it half right, and we're missing a very important half. One of the things I like about James in these verses is that he doesn't pull any punches about who we're supposed to be. And he closes it with this thought where he reminds us that no new or exciting ministry or church trend will ever replace our calling to help those in need, the poor, the hungry, the widow, the orphan. Those will never go out of style. Those will will never be optional for us if we are to be a church that follows Christ. Jesus said, And I think I've preached this before here, and I think I said that to me this is one of the scariest verses in all of Scripture. Jesus said that there will be people one day who will say, Lord, Lord, when did we see you? And the response from Jesus will be, depart from me. I do not know you. Why? Because they failed to do the basics. They were looking for Jesus and the next big thing instead of what was right there in front of them. And no amount of head knowledge will ever replace obedience. So if I take that fact and I take what Jesus said, then unfortunately what it adds up to is that there's a lot of people in churches all over this country who will miss out on eternity with Jesus. They'll miss it. And they'll miss it by roughly 16 inches. Because everything that went in here, for all their knowledge, for all their studies, for all that they have memorized, never made its way here. It never transformed this. It never got put into practice. Because somewhere along the line, we felt like obedience was optional. Word and deed. Word and deed. Right belief. Right action. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
this time, Pastor Thad's going to come forward and we are going to prepare to receive the Lord's Supper. And as we do, I'll let him give instructions, but just to remind you that the altar is always open and we encourage you to take advantage of that and to spend time with God as God is working on your heart and mind today. Remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us and I think the crux of what I hear Robert saying is we are called to be a living sacrifice for God because of all that God has done for us we are now called to be a living sacrifice pure and holy tried and true for Almighty God because God has shown us such great mercy and so we prepare to come to the table of the Lord today and I think our only response is thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you have done for us. So we remember that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as often as you will in remembrance of me symbol of God's great mercy and sacrifice for us when the supper was over Jesus took the cup gave it to his disciples he gave thanks to the father and he said drink from this all of you this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of your sins drink this as often as you will in remembrance of me the body and the blood of Christ broken for us he calls us to be his holy vessels in the world today so let us pray almighty god we thank you for your great mercy and your love we thank you for the ultimate sacrifice that you made for us through your son jesus christ and lord may we become pure holy vessels of yours transform our minds transform our hearts Make them be one with you, Lord Jesus. Now we ask for your blessing on these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood and set forth for joyful obedience to you. We ask this blessing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is the table of the Lord, so it is open to everyone. You do not have to be a member of St. Luke. We are all sinners. None of us are worthy to be here. But because of the grace and the mercy of God, this table is open to everyone. So we'll invite you to come in just a moment and receive these elements. And as Robert has said, spend time at the altar, uh, either before or after you receive the elements, whichever you prefer. If those who are going to help me serve will come, we'll serve each other, and then we'll be prepared to serve you.
still have gluten-free available, so if you need gluten-free, come to this station. We'll be glad to serve you. So as you feel led, won't you come and let us worship and sacrifice to Christ.
would now please stand and receive the benediction. Lord, we do ask that your praise be on our lips. Lord, may the words we speak, the meditations of our hearts, the actions that we engage in each and every day, may they all reflect the life and love and grace that you, by your very nature, represent and model for us. Lord, we want to be consistent in our word and our deed. We want to be committed to you in our word and our deed. And so, Lord, we offer ourselves, our whole selves to you as an act of sacrifice, as an act of service. Lord, we need you. We can't do it without you. But there's no greater joy than doing it with you. So I ask now your blessing on each and every person gathered here. Bless their family, bless their homes. Keep them safe and in your arms until we meet again. And all God's people said, Have a blessed week, everyone.